Hello, everyone. Welcome back to LinkedIn Live. It's our second show. Hopefully, you can all hear us. First and foremost, I'm joined by my, my guest here, uh, Jen Crenshaw. J Jen, we met two hours ago, right? That's about right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> two, two hours ago, and, there, and here we are. So we, we had a great conversation, guys. And I said to Jen, you know what, Jen? How about we just get you online right now, live with everyone? So it's uh, it's pretty fantastic. So welcome yeah. to the show, guys. If you're new to HR Leaders Podcast, um, on the show, we interview today's most successful and innovative HR practitioners five days a week. And it's now going to be here live with you all on LinkedIn. Um, so welcome to the show, Jen. Um, before you. we jump in, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself personally and sure. your journey to where we are today. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I am a human resources professional. I've, I've been in HR for, for over 20 years. It's a little crazy that I can say that. <laughs> um, but uh, currently um, on educational sabbatical, I'm a, a student at Georgia State University working on my doctorate in business administration and uh, have chosen to study career transition and, and very specifically identity. Um, and, and how our identity um, is affected by our career transition process and um, decided to, to really focus in on the, the transition that military veterans go through. Um, so I'll be talking with a, a host of, of Army veterans mm -hmm. um, about their own career transition uh, into the civilian world and, uh, and, and then publishing that as my dissertation. So really excited. I'm, I'm in the throes of it right now. I'm going through all the, the check boxes that, uh, that you go through to, to get um, approval to do research. And, um, and it's, it's just a lot of fun. Really, really supportive uh, team at, at Georgia State University. Couldn't, uh, couldn't say enough about that program. Um, and just, uh, it's been, it's been a lot of fun and, and really enjoyed my conversation with you this morning on this, on this topic. Yeah. So look, look forward to continuing. Well, thank you for being brave enough to say yes. Yeah. I was, sure. I was speaking to you and I was like, you know what? I wish I was live on LinkedIn right now, Jen, sharing this with everyone. So I was like, let's do it. And you were crazy enough to say yes. And here we are. And that's here the magic are. of what we do, right? We jump on a call. You're halfway across the world. Two hours later, we're live here on LinkedIn with everyone. So how amazing is that? Uh, it's, cool. <laughs> so tell, tell us, um, what was the, why did you decide to go on an educational sabbatical? You've worked in incredible organizations, you know, likes of Burger yeah. King and, and, and you know, huge multinationals. What made you think, you know what, I want to step away for, for a second on an educational sabbat sabbatical before I come back and return? Yeah, so I this uh, this program is, is an accelerated program. And so it's, it's uh, you know, three years. And, and at first, I wasn't going to take time. Um, I, I was able to, um, you know, make it work um, with a, a full time work schedule. And, and most of my classmates are still working full time. And and I was, too, for the first 18 months of the program. Um, and then just really decided, you know, through a, a course of, of several things that it made a lot of sense for me to just kind of, um, you know, step back. And um, and spend some thought time. I'll tell you that you know, in in a in a very busy twenty year career in HR, sometimes um, I, I I love to produce. I love to to do and see yeah. the fruits of my labor. And so I don't always take the time that I should to reflect, mm -hmm. um, to to kind of stop pushing myself to produce. And really, just sit back and um, and have thought time and have reflection time. And um, so, I, I will just say that this has been um, it's it's been hard um, to not work, honestly. And um, and I actually I actually picked up a part time uh, teaching job at Emory University as an adjunct faculty because I was having a hard time not you can help working. yourself. <laughs> yeah, help myself. Yep, and and that's been so so incredibly rewarding working with um with with bachelor students um getting their uh, degree in business and um so th so that's been great but but it really I mean the the sabbatical was really about just deciding to to really focus on and giving a, you know critical mass of my time um to to this research and and it's phenomenal. Fantastic. And what really fascinated me about our conversation earlier is that not only are you researching this topic, but you're also currently going through the process of finding your next CHRO role, role right. yourself. So can you share That's more right. about your experience? She was very honest and open with me earlier about what you're experiencing uh, and, and then kind of gave you a newfound perspective from, from going through the process yourself. It really did. Like, you know, I started my career in HR as a recruiter, right? So talent acquisition is, is really near and dear to my heart, talent acquisition processes. I've worked, um, 
as a, as a, a client of some of the best RPOs in the business. Um, in, in working with, you know, some of the, the companies that I've worked with. And, and I know really great um, recruitment process. And I know, you know, not so great recruitment process. I've uh, unfortunately, you know, led some teams where I, you know, I, I always, um, you know, are, are I'm pushing us to be better and better all the time. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, being now on the other side of that, being the, the candidate, um, working with some amazing executive search firms um, and, and some really great um, recruiters. It's a, it's a tough time in our profession right now for just how, how we balance this awesomeness of technology that allows for us to post a job and get hundreds, if not thousands of applicants for a job. And then the challenge that comes with then creating a a great candidate experience. Um, And I have to say, it's, you know, sitting on the other side of it. I mean, I'm embarrassed to admit that I've had, you know, recruitment colleagues who've left, you know, who've stood me up on, you know, video interviews. I've been logged in for a video interview and they just don't show up. And I've unfortunately and embarrassingly been the recipient of, of going at being a final candidate for CHRO jobs um, and never hearing back. That's crazy. From the recruiter <laughs> on what happened with that position. And so, I mean, final candidate, like met with the CEO of a, of a company looking to hire a CHRO and you know, weeks go by and literally not getting an an update call on what's happened with that job. And, and so, you know, look, these are great people. These are, are, you know, well-trained, well-intended, super networked executive recruiters. I know that there are good reasons why these things are happening. I know there had to have been a good reason why I got stood up on that video interview by that recruiter. I know there has to be a good reason why I didn't hear back from that recruiter related to that position. Yet, here I am, a candidate. This is my experience. It really doesn't feel good. And it really does drive me to, you know, even, you know, even more really think about what does this career transition experience look like, feel like, um, and how are we treating candidates? And I'll tell you, this will change how I coach and lead um, talent acquisition functions that report to me in the future. Um, probably probably fair warning uh, for, for anywhere that I land. I'll probably <laughs> take, be taking a deep dive into our candidate experience process really early in my tenure. And with the executive search firms that you use. <laughs> and with the executive search firms we use. That's uh, right. Yeah, because you, 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 how much control do you have? Or first and foremost, can everyone listening in the chat, can you relate to what Jen's saying? Because I, I can, because I've been in those in those situations where I've just not heard anything back. I've gone yeah. through four stages of interviews and got to the last stage and then nothing. And it makes you feel really insecure at some, at some point. Yeah. I mean, I, personally, I did. I was like, is it, was it me? Did I say something wrong? You know, sure. you know, no feedback. I'd rather have some feedback, even if it's negative feedback, because this is constructive and I can, you know, go from there. Right. <laughs> but not That's to hear right. anything at all, especially at your level. I appreciate regardless of the job, it should be good. But I am actually shocked to hear at the executive level when you're interviewing yeah. at billion dollar organizations that's right they still are not uh, haven't got this you know it, it kind of experience down so pretty shocking pretty shocking and we're not going to mention any names guys but you know who you are yeah, that's right <laughs> you know who you are guys who didn't come back to jen and shame on you <laughs> <laughs> so um why yeah. are, are why are they not coming back to why are recruiters not coming back to the camp? is it because they're so busy is it because you know what what, what do you think yeah, well, I mean, look, I can only I can only go by my own experience as a recruiter, right? And it's it's you know been in in very recent years that that I was responsible for filling you know executive level jobs, um, at, you know, as as an HR professional, and you know you do get just hundreds, if not thousands, of applicants for for these jobs, and and you know it's. It's such a challenge to, you know, ensure that the best candidates are, are rising to the top. And yes, I think, you know, I think recruiters are carrying very, very heavy requisition loads. 
Um, I think that we we look at you know the technological advances and we say, look, this can give us amazing efficiency, right? So because we have all these technological advances, we think recruiters can carry much heavier requisition loads than they have in the past. And so we're we're giving recruiters these very heavy requisition loads. And then you know it's it becomes very challenging for them to to keep up with all of the 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 details of that. And so, you know, look, I'm I'm going by, you know, my own experience of times when I have to look at myself and say, you know, in what searches did I potentially drop the ball as a recruiter, right? As I sit in in judgment of of having had these experiences, you know, did did what did I call in late for an appointment with somebody because, you know, my schedule got so crazy and I it was hard to manage that you know, I connected, you know, five, 10 minutes late to an interview with somebody. And did that make them feel, um, you know, a lack of respect for them and for their time? I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, yeah, I probably, you know, that probably did happen with, with me as the recruiter in those situations. Yeah. You know, are, are there times when maybe I didn't get back to people and give them um, really valuable feedback that they needed to continue to, you know, continue on their search. Maybe they weren't the right fit for that job at that time, but you know, they were really um, hungry for the feedback, like you were saying, right? To so that at least they would know. Okay, what was the reason? Is there something? Am I am I okay with that reason? And I just say, look, this wasn't the right fit, and that thing that you're giving me feedback on, look, that's just who I am, and I'm okay with that. I'm okay that that wasn't a good fit, and I accept that we're not a match. Or was it feedback that they really needed to hear because they say, wow, that's not how I want to come across. Mm. And so I do want to change maybe how I answered that question or how I responded in that situation because that's re- I really didn't represent myself well. And so I, I want to change that. And I think, you know, I think as a recruiter, I've not always given people that meaningful feedback that would help them. And again, you know, in this back and forth now of being on the other side, right? I think it changes how I see my responsibility to candidates yeah. uh, in, in giving them that meaningful feedback so that they can then decide for themselves. Did I present myself in the best light and I wasn't a fit and that's okay? Or do I really want to, to tweak the way I'm presenting myself? Yeah. And that's, that's if you even get to that stage. Right. You know, we were talking about before, right, earlier about how difficult now is to even get in the door for an interview, let alone let alone get feedback and get to the second or third right. stage, uh, the black hole of technology. And uh, I was sharing uh, an example with you, wasn't I, about, I'm not going to mention names here on like LinkedIn Live, but uh, right. I, I was working with uh, one of our members, uh, ch- the chief HR officer, sort of, um, one of the largest companies in the world, tech companies in the world, mm-hmm. and uh, was applying for a similar role who uh, he was perfect for couldn't be better and it dropped me an email saying chris i'm trying to get hold of uh, the, the hr leaders at this company because i'm i want to uh, you know go for this new role i can't get anyone and i was like in shock because like you are you know the hr executive one of the biggest companies in the world and you can't even get an interview and get through the door and it's only through me making those personal introductions via email and, and, and phone call that i got an email a few weeks later saying chris thank you so much i've now so I'm now working in, in my dream job. Thank you. But the, thing, the fact that that person couldn't, was just, you know, applying on LinkedIn, getting no response, going through executive search firms and still getting no response and had to take it on themselves to, you know, reach out to their network, people like myself, and also pick up the phone and make it happen because yeah. leaving it into someone else's hands and sort of praying for your dream job. <laughs> um, yeah. That is not, that is not the best strategy in the world, but I appreciate it's not easy for everyone to go ahead and do that. And they may not have the necessary network or skills to feel comfortable in picking up the phone and selling themselves for that role. I feel like we, you know, I feel like there's, I, I was saying to Chris earlier today, you know, when, as, you know, as a researcher right now, I, I often say when you're, when you're a hammer, everything's a nail, right? So, so everything looks like a, a future research project to me at the moment. And so, you know, to that point, right, it, I feel like I could, we, we could write a paper, you know, when, when the funnel becomes a black hole. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's, and, and, you know, I feel like, you know, that's really what we're, we're dealing with in, in talent acquisition right now is that, you know, we have such an opportunity to attract such a wide variety of candidates. And then, you know, what do we do with that funnel and how do we ensure that that funnel doesn't become a black hole? And, you know, I can say, you know, I've had people reach out to me and, and say, look, hey, you know, I see this job. 
um, you know, in this company that I that I know that you work in or that I know that you have a network into, you know, how how do I get noticed for this job? Because I I feel like I'm the perfect candidate. And I say, you know, first of all, it's really important that you go ahead and apply online because the company is going to want to make sure that that your application is officially in that applicant tracking system. And that's just, you know, that's a sounds like a checkbox kind of thing, but you, you know, you definitely do want to go ahead and apply online, but then you do need to activate your personal network, right? So you do need to make those phone calls, make those linked out reach outs to people that you know, and that know you Mm -hmm. and really follow that thread because ultimately you are likely going to need somebody inside that organization to pull your application out of the black hole and put it toward the top of the stack. So the recruiter or the hiring manager actually read your resume or actually look at your LinkedIn profile because you know it's it's of no of no intent. They're not intentionally ignoring Yeah, of course. Anybody. If it doesn't have and the right keyword, the right candidate too. Exactly, yeah. It's just unfortunate because they have such a hard job where you guys are getting thousands of applications and obviously a lot of that goes through the software, whether it's keyword, looking for different keywords and that's right. Uh, within that. And you there's so many there's so much incredible talent just, just being, you know, sent to the black hole and you never seen him ever again. Um and so it's it's tough on both sides. So it was definitely not one one sided and some of the, for everyone listening, if, if you're looking to apply for a job on LinkedIn or uh, one of the pieces of advice I'll give you, which has worked for me and a lot of friends in, in, in my, in my, in my uh, circle is when you go on LinkedIn, right, you see a job that's been posted. You can see the person on LinkedIn who's posted that job. On the right-hand side, you can see the name. What I always do with a friend is click on the person who's posted that job on LinkedIn and message them personally on LinkedIn say hi and you know write a little statement about why you feel you're right for that role and reach out to them directly to set up a call or a time to just to, to, to talk as opposed to just applying on LinkedIn and That's hoping right. they come back to you and uh, I had a friend recently who spent the entire weekend sent a few hundred messages uh, it sounds like a lot of work and three days later he had he had, had a job at a company he really wanted to work for but you know take it into your own hands as opposed to just applying to jobs and in the hope someone re- replies as well and if you guys are interested i have a template um that i said that that i made for my friends who are looking for new roles that they send to people on linkedin and hiring managers about why they feel like and so if you can fill in the gaps <laughs> in the middle yeah. about why you feel just sit there spend it spend a day messaging you know find do your linkedin sales navigator search find those jobs that you're interested in and message the hiring managers directly they're going to hate me for saying that by now <laughs> <laughs> but but it, but it works right so yeah. um so that's, that's from my own sales experience as well so um yeah um hasrat mentioned in the in the chat he said um why did you decide to leave the organization to go on a sabbatical as opposed to going on a sabbatical you know doing what you're doing now and then returning to the same organization just out of interest yeah so i mean i hate to sound like a, a real hr person here but but i am look it 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 depends right i mean every situation is is very individual um if your company allows for educational sabbaticals and you can take a sabbatical and return to the same company i, I think that's fantastic um i think you know if, if those options are available and that's and and you are really you you are really enjoying um, the the relationship that you have with your company, and that's something that can be worked out. I think you know. Look, as an HR professional, I'm always going to be up for you know the retention of talent and the development of talent inside an organization. Um, so that's the to the degree that you can work that out with your company and and do that you know inside and 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 work out that relationship. I I think that's an amazing opportunity. Um, I, you know, my choice was, was a very individual one, right? I mm-hmm. mean, it, it just, um, made sense for, for me to, to do it the way I did. Um, but that doesn't mean that I, I, I would, you know, I, I had an emotional reaction, Chris, when you were reading, um, that question and it said, you know, should I resign my job and go for higher education? Um, my, my, you know, kind of my emotional reaction to that was, I, I, you know, like, oh my gosh, that's not necessarily what I'm recommending to anybody at all, except that, I don't know, maybe I am, right? I yeah, mean, maybe it's right for you at that right time. It really depends. 
Like you exactly. Said. Right. I, I mean, don't so, quit your job if you've got a mortgage, guys. <laughs> right. And you've got a yeah. family to be. Don't go and quit yeah. your job and go to educational yeah. school, unless you can afford it. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. I mean, that's a big that's a big decision to make. Right. So if you've if you know, this is not a, a financial planning podcast or, a, you know, financial planning LinkedIn live. Right. But but, you know, I would say, you know, don't resign your job if you're if if you don't have a financial plan for how you're going to make that work for yourself. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And uh, it's great that you've taken the time out to focus on your own personal development. The yeah. entire reason that we a part of why we started this company is to give senior HR executives that time away from the organization to network, yeah. benchmark and learn from their peers in that environment because during the day at work they're so caught up in the day and day running of the organization there's so mm -hmm. you, you get opportunity to reflect and, and see That's where right. you are and, and on that point i'm really excited that you're going to be joining us in new york at johnson and johnson for our next yes. workshop so it's kind of testament that you've also invested in us as organization again for yeah. your personal development so i really appreciate that john had a really good question he asked that you know within the organizations that you work within you've led you know hr functions in huge uh, multinational mm -hmm. So billion dollar organizations, right? Yeah. Um, how, with your team, how did you mitigate bias in the recruitment process? Did you have a mandatory training for everyone in your team? Yeah. So, I, you know, in the companies that I've worked for, we have, we, we do, um, you know, uh, unconscious bias training. Yeah. Um, and, and um, you know, that's certainly been um, the most successful recently is, is really helping people understand their own unconscious bias and having a, a, a framework and a plan for how you can recognize when you, when you might be leaning into your own bias so that you can question that and make sure that you are making really great decisions. But definitely believe in, in um, I, I say mandatory, compulsory. I, I mean, I, you know, I would hope that most recruitment professionals, most HR professionals, you don't have to make it mandatory for them to to get excited to be a part of it, right? Yeah, like, yeah. It kind of takes away a bit of the excitement about it if you say it's mandatory. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, you know, look, in in truth, it was mandatory. I, mm, yeah, you know, of course, of course. <laughs> right. Yeah. But I but I didn't necessarily, you know, we didn't as a team necessarily market it that way. It was more like, hey, we have this really we have this really great training that's gonna that's that's gonna make you think about your job as a recruiter a little bit differently. And so, you know, and that was you know most recently unconscious bias training. It, you know, throughout my career, it's been you know as as the work in diversity and inclusion and belonging has has changed over time, right? These these uh, thankfully um, the training and and how we think about it and how we educate ourselves um, to be aware. Um, has changed over time. And so in the beginning, it was really just some, you know, some awareness training or, or what, what we called it 20 years ago, you know, sensitivity training, yeah. right? Being more aware yeah. of how you see the world and that other people see the world differently than you do. And um, just had some really amazing experiences over the years with those kinds of training. But yes, I think, you know, I think hiring managers should have to, um, you know, in, in in a perfect world, you know, any you know any um, organization would have their hiring managers go through unconscious bias training, um, and understand that look, we are naturally attracted to people who make us feel good about ourselves, and the people who make us feel good about ourselves are the people who validate us. And so, when we are giving ourselves, and we feel like ourselves are coming back. That's a validation to our identity and to ourself. And this gets a little bit into my research, honestly, on, on identity and career transition is that there's this validation process of like, okay, who I am is, is resonating with you and who you are is resonating with me. And we're validating each other's identities. And then both people walk away going, wow, I really liked that person. Well, what is it I liked? Well, I liked that he or she made me feel good about myself. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's then how we end up building teams where maybe there isn't the kind of diversity that we actually state we want. Right. Yeah. We want diversity. We know the business case for diversity. We know it should be there. Nobody's arguing that. But then how do you actually make it happen? And actually making it happen is that recruiters and hiring managers have to be aware of their own bias 
aware of the fact that they get attracted to people who validate them and make them feel good about themselves Mm -hmm. and make sure that we're really selecting people that are going to challenge us and that are going to make us better as a team. Yeah, completely, completely agree with you. And uh, I had one more question from um, from from Kripa before we jump into your sort of research into what you're doing yeah. now. And she she asked f- from a personal point of view during this transition uh, and this period of re- reflection and learning yourself. Do you look at HR differently now? Are there anything that you know what what what's uh, you know what's come to mind for yourself? Anything you do differently now looking back when you move into your your next role? What will you be doing differently? I hesitate to say that it that I that it that this is an example of how I look at it differently, but maybe how I look at it in more fullness. Sure, sure, understand. Right. Yeah. yeah so, understand. You know, I, I feel it in, and, and so what I would say is that you know, in thinking about it, I really have, and and Chris, this was something that came up with us this morning. I really have been thinking a lot um, about how adding technology to HR processes um, is affecting our relationship with employees inside of organizations. And so if human resources is really the you know, kind of the, the owner of the employee at, to organization relationship, and how do we cause people to feel really connected and really feel like they are some, they are part of something bigger than themselves, um, and not just a number, right? They're not just their Emple ID in the HRIS system, right? But that they are really a valued member of this team. And when you work in an organization that has 60,000 employees, that's not always easy to do, right? But, you know, so in really thinking about that, what, what I have been spending a lot of time thinking about and, and what I think I would do in more fullness um, moving forward It's just really asking those questions around, okay, look, employee self-service is good. Manager self-service is good. But what connection point do we lose with that? And how do we both embrace what is good about technology, about efficiency, about employee and manager self-service without losing those meaningful connection points? And I, I use a really simple example to, to kind of illustrate it. And I say, okay, look, you know, but let go back, you know, 20 years ago and, and you were a part of an organization and you were buying your first house, right? You're a young family, you have school age kids, you were going from renting a property that somebody else owned to you're now moving and buying your own home in a school district you've chosen because this is what's good for you and your family you would potentially walk uh, into the office of your HR representative and you would say, hey, we moved, I have a new address. And there would be, there would be interaction, there would be humanness, there would be, tell me about Bonding. your, yeah, wow, Bonding, yeah. you bought a new house and are you excited? And this is, and this would have been a celebratory moment for you. Now, and you would have shared that with another human being that you work with, that that makes you feel connected to and tied to. Now, you, um, if you ask HR how you change your address, you get an email back with a link. Not, not even an email, a chatbot. Right, that's right, the chatbot. Exactly. You get a chatbot reply saying, enter here, update here. Correct, right? That yeah. gives you a link where you can go do it yourself. Now, the reality is, is that it's not that you mind typing in your own address on this link. That's the way the world has turned and we're all used to it and it's fine. So look, keep the link, keep the employee self-service. That's important. But how do we ensure that we don't lose the human aspect that was a part of that, that potential celebration? Even if it was just two or three minutes of we're so excited we bought our first house, yeah. right? But does that get lost? Does that human connection get lost? And I'm not saying that's the only way it happens. That's just an example of how it had, I, you know, it, all of this has changed the way I'm thinking about, you know, I love technology. I love applying technology. I, you know, I'm always going to look for ways to make something more efficient, better. um, And I'll continue to do that as an HR leader, but I'm, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to forget to ask myself and my team the question, is there a lost opportunity to connect and what are we going to do about it? Yeah. 
I think that's the balance, isn't it, between the human element and the technology that we have to find. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So tell us more about the research you're doing at the moment. Yeah. So I'm really excited about it. So I, I mentioned, so um, look, I um, have just a, a real passion around um, supporting our, our uh, military in their career transition. So after they've served, whether that be for four years or whether that be for 30 years, um, you know, oftentimes there's a, a you know, a choice um, to, you know, leave the military and, and then go in, into a civilian career. And especially those folks who serve, you know, four, six, 10 years, you know, clearly, you know, they're in their, you know, late 20s, early 30s, you know, looking for, a, you know, the fullness of a civilian career from that point forward. And um, so really thinking about this career transition process and, and what that means to them. And, and, you know, I started really thinking about belonging. Um, and, and it's so, so important. Um, and, you know, in every in, in almost everything that we've talked about here, uh, you know, just now, there's there's been some tie back to, you know, feeling like you belong. And, and that's so critically important. And so as I dug into that idea of belonging and what that must mean or, or how what that must look like for a, an army veteran who's moving from their service in the army into the civilian career world, it really became more of an individual question of identity and how we we manage our identity, right? So if if you know somebody has identified as being a soldier in the army, that's been incredibly important to them and to their family and and to their way of life um, during their time of service. And now they're making the decision to to discharge and and uh, to go into the civilian workforce. And what part of that identity will always be a part of who they are? And how do we help them move that identity into the civilian work world? And so, you know, thinking about that outplacement process that they go through, which which the Army calls Soldier for Life Transition Assistance Program, learning how to write resumes so that the civilian world can understand them, learning how to interview so that you're really able to, to communicate your transferable skills. And then you get that job offer and now you go to onboarding, right? And now it's this opportunity to learn what does it mean to be a part of this new organization and how am I expected to behave here and how do I belong here? And what happens to my identity as a soldier or my identity as a veteran, right? Because I go from maybe potentially seeing my identity as an active duty soldier to now seeing my identity as a as an army veteran. But how does all of that, how, what, what does all of that look like in terms of now I'm trying to be a member of this new community, mm -hmm. this civilian workforce, this company that I'm, that I'm joining? And what is that, what does that look like? And look, we're, I mean, as humans, we all manage many roles and many identities, right? So we are sons and daughters and sisters and workers and friends and parents, right? And so we're not any one identity at a time. We we are always a, a bit of a, you know, I've heard it described as a kaleidoscope um, <laughs> of identities. And I really like that. I really like that visual. Um, but then there's a, a management piece that comes to that. So that's really what I'm digging into. I'll be, be speaking with Army veterans and, and talking to them about their um, experience of moving into the civilian world and really trying to understand how that experience affected their identity. Mm -hmm. um, and by learning from people who went through it and learning from how their identity was affected, I hope to then come back to the, the world of HR practice and say, look, you know, here's what I've learned from people who have gone through it. Here's how the programs and processes that we put in place um, as HR teams either work or don't work. And so what can we do to encourage them to um, embrace the identities that give them uh, confidence and self-efficacy um, while also making sure that they feel like they really do belong with us and they're a good fit with us because we want to, we want to hire them and we want to retain them. Yeah. And you mentioned beforehand that during the time, for example, at uh, Burger King, when you was yeah. looking to hire, um, 20%, I think you had sort of four, three or 400 roles to fill at the time. That's right. And you wanted sort of 20% of that to come from sort of the military, sort of ex-military coming in and, yeah. Uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you also mentioned in terms of them writing their own CVs, they were encouraged not to share 
too much information. Can you explain a bit yeah. more about that? Which I thought was a real shame considering the leadership skills they developed and the incredible skills that you developed within the army that are transferable into the corporate world. Yeah. So I'll say that this was, you know, this was occurring more than 10 years ago and we've come a very long way. There are some amazing um, services and yes. databases and, and organizations out there that have, have really helped um, with this problem over the last over the last decade. Um, and so we're we're doing much better today. But yes, it was a very real example where, you know, I was hiring and it was it was 200 people uh, across the country. Um, it was a new role that we were putting in place in our franchise services division of, of Burger King. And um, we had the opportunity. I, I could um, I could set those hiring goals and I had the support that I needed to say, look, I you know, I want to hire you know, I want 20 percent of, of this group of new hires to be military veterans, because at that point we were roughly 10 years past um, 9-11. There had been a lot of volunteer troops. Uh, that had gone to Iraq and Afghanistan. They were coming home and they were looking for this transition. And um, the uh, Obama administration had hiring our heroes uh, um, as a part of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And there was just there was a lot going on. Um, and it was in the news a lot. Right. Hire a veteran, hire a veteran. I was like, look, we can do this at Burger King. We are we are really committed to doing this. And and we had the 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 will to do it. Um, and we had a really hard time finding veterans. And some of it had to do with, um, I believe, technology and keyword searching and those kinds of things. And you bring up, you know, there was so much going on at that time around, you know, write your resume so that you're using civilian terminology. Yeah, yeah, which is a shame. And there just was, there's, you know, lost in translation. Yeah. Right. And mm -hmm. there's and and that's um and that's uh you know some some research that I did last summer is that whole idea of like how do you translate um the the military experience into the civilian world? To your point, there's the leadership skills, they get so much leadership training. There's you know the idea of of resilience and self-efficacy. I mean, there's just so much like really positive, you know, sometimes we call it soft skills, right? And a veteran probably doesn't like to hear that they are that they are desired for their soft skills. Um, <laughs> but that's true, right? Yeah, I mean, of course. A, that's a reality, right? They do learn a lot of amazing leadership skills. Yeah. And think about some of these non-commissioned officers. It's it's a, a very particular area of passion for me is this idea that you know non-commissioned officers are managing million dollar budgets. They're managing hundreds of troops. But yet oftentimes they haven't yet had the time to get maybe a bachelor's degree because they've been very busy with their military service and they have very full lives as non-commissioned officers and oftentimes with young families. And so they come out of the military and they're all, even though they likely have more transferable experience in managing large budgets and managing large teams. In chaos. In it, chaos, right? It, which is what we need in corporations right now, leading through <laughs> the VUCA right? world. <laughs> yes, yeah. right? Likely more relatable and transferable experiences than their MBA cohorts coming out of some very well-known schools with amazing programs. I cast no shadow. I, I you know, I, I, I have a master's degree. I'm getting a doctorate. Clearly, I believe in higher education. But that said... How do you match up? So you've got somebody coming out with an MBA. I'm sure they're brilliant, but have they managed these very large multi-million dollar budgets? Have they managed these very large hundreds of troops size teams in comparison? And sometimes we overlook these NCOs and these amazing experiences that they have. And, you know, we, we lean toward this, the, you know, the, the, um, high priced brand name MBA. And again, casting no shade. I'm just saying we, you know, it's, it's something to think about a bit differently. Yeah, definitely. Uh, one of the questions I had from John on, on LinkedIn said, how do you approach the veteran community that represent different dimensions of diversity and have different experiences? So the LGBT community, for example, do you have mm -hmm. any experience in that area? Have you done any research around that of how you would approach the different diverse communities? 
Yeah, I mean, so, you know, one thing is that, you know, certainly the military community is as diverse um, and, and it has been said that in some ways, maybe even more diverse um, than than the the population at large. Right. And so by, you know, to use, you know, my old school recruiting terms, if I'm fishing in that pond. Right. That's a very that's a very highly diverse pond to fish in. And so mm -hmm. that's a that's a, just a good thing in and of itself. You're, you're likely to, to have a very diverse workforce coming out of the, the military. Um, I have not done any specific research on the military and the LGBTQ community. Um, that's not an area that I consider myself an expert at all. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that is, um, I, I, I think people who have a, a, a passion in that in particular um, I would encourage research there because I think it's, yeah, I think it's, very it's really important. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's still a very, very tough topic, right? I think there's still a lot of emotion um, around how you, you know, how we manage the and, and make sure that we are honoring um, the, the LGBTQ community in who, who desire to serve in the military um, and desire. And that gets me to that identity management, right? In terms of how do I, um, you know, fulfill a desire I have to serve my country and be a member of the military and still stay true to myself and who I am and not feel like I have to mask or hide who I am. Yeah. And, I, you know, that's still a very, uh, still a very challenging topic. I don't think that we have great answers on that yet. Yeah, definitely agree to that. For everyone listening as well, guys, let us know, you know, what are, were your biggest challenges that you faced during your career transitions? You know, yes. we, we wanted to go live today to hear from you, to hear your experiences and insights as well. Whilst we're waiting for those questions to come in, I'd love for you to share your story about how you use technology in your recruitment process and you use video. Yeah. I think because I think, that it is, you know, the, that is part of the challenge is obviously engaging with candidates. And I Absolutely. think, and I think, video is definitely an, an area where we're seeing great strides. And you mentioned uh, how it was so useful for you in the team. So you can, can you share more on that? Absolutely, yeah, happy to. I so uh, this was uh, a couple of years ago, but I know that it's still um, where you know video interviewing has only gained traction. Um, but I was I was an early adopter. Um, I worked specifically with with WePow at the time when I was at New Signature. Um, as the, the CHRO and, and responsible for IT recruiting. And at New Signature, we were very, very passionate about um, hiring folks who uh, were very highly qualified from an IT skills perspective and also had just an amazing customer service um, approach and attitude. It was really what we were built on um, and, and how important it was to us. And so there were a lot of a lot of very interested stakeholders. And so I was sharing with Chris that our interview panels became very large. <laughs> yeah. And uh, there are a lot of people who wanted to be a part of the decision making process on the hires that we were bringing into the organization. And that is both a, a blessing and a curse when you're the recruiter, right? Like you you want that level of engagement from from the decision makers. You you don't want to be on an island, you know, like you certainly as a recruiter or don't want to feel like you're the only one meeting this candidate and making this decision. And, and you, you know, you really want that consensus and that collaboration. But then also we all know that with every additional interviewer adds time to schedule, time to do, time to get together, all of that, right? So video interviewing was a, was a godsend, right? So it was, it was, um, it was, it was recorded video. So the way, and you can obviously do live video very much like what we're doing right now. And that is very common. And I think used a lot, I think live video is used a lot in interviews um, today, mm -hmm. but I, I think, I don't know if recorded video is used as often, um, but I find it incredibly helpful, especially when you have a lot of decision makers. So, so yeah, explain your process of how you did, because I think yeah. a lot of people is quite new to them and it was great because it helped you take out some of the complexity that's right. <laughs> from your leaders and then also gave them some urgency <laughs> as leaders to, yeah. not, to not get distracted and also make sure they're engaged in the and process it, and it and it um and i will share the process it, and i'll say the other thing that it definitely did was it allowed the candidates to yeah, exactly. actually meet mm -hmm. if you will the the uh some of the most the the highest level leaders in the organization so i recorded um some of the the cultural fit type questions 
um, as the CHRO of the company. What and then they, I had, what they be, by the way, sorry, Suzanne, what, what were some of those questions? I'm sure people yeah. were thinking, what are those? What questions would the HR executive CHRO want to know to, to see if I'm a cultural fit? What were they? Sure. So as I was mentioning, um, high touch customer service was critically important to us, right? So the, uh, you know, as a, as an IT consultant, whether it was in a help desk job or whether it was in a much, it, whether you were a, an engineer solving, you know, some, some pretty um, important, you know, data center kinds of, of data mapping issues, right? That customer service and that ability to, to, you know, um, you know, gather, gather information from the customer and be high touch. So my questions were very much around, you know, at, pr pretty standard, you know, behavioral interviewing questions around, you know, tell me about a time when you had a difficult customer situation and how did you win that person over? Right. Mm -hmm. So what, no, it wasn't that the questions themselves were magic, right? It was, you know, your pretty standard questions, but I recorded myself asking those questions. Which is and important. Yeah. Which, mm -hmm would record their answers. And then additionally, we had the chief technology officer ask and record himself asking very specific technology driven questions, things that were really important to him. And I won't be able to tell you what any of those questions were. <laughs> yeah. I, five years ago, I knew them, but right now I don't. Of course, of um, course. Yes, but they were very, very specific, you know, engineering type questions. And so then we would get these recorded videos back. They would be 10 to 15 minutes worth of video interview. And every candidate had answered the same questions, right? So we were, so we were getting to that, what you always try to do as a recruiter, right? With structured interviews to try to have that apples to apples comparison. Mm -hmm. And because it was recorded, both the questions were recorded and the answers were recorded. We, in fact, had the same pieces of data on every candidate. And so then I would send that link out to the interview committee. And that might have been as many as 10 people might have been on this interview committee. They all watched the video. When I would send it out, I would send it out with a meeting invite and I would basically give them five business days and say, look, I'm, you know, I'm sending this out on Wednesday afternoon. Next Wednesday afternoon, we're going to have a call. Everybody who can make it is going to come and we're going to talk about your experience of having watched these videos and decide if this candidate moves on to live round. Mm -hmm. and, if, and, and if you don't, you, if you don't, you miss out. That's right. <laughs> yeah, and it's yeah. your own fault. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I would say to them, look, I know we do this a lot. I know it's very time consuming, but here's the deal. If you feel really strongly one way or the other, you need to absolutely show up to this discussion. Yeah, I love it. If you don't feel strongly one way or the other about this candidate, you're okay that we hire them or you're okay that we don't. And something else pops onto your calendar. Just know that the people who do show up are going to make the decision. Yeah, fantastic. I'm so happy you shared that story because uh, I think more and more now we need to start using similar tools. That's where I see technology is really interesting. Absolutely. You get to see the personality behind both the lead. You, you get to feel connected to both the people that are interviewing you and the candidate yes. uh, through video. And that's what the magic of video is. And which is why I'm here, we're all here with you guys right now is that you, you know, some, of my, I, some people that I consider my best friends I've never met them for years and I spoke to them through Zoom calls and video. Yeah. A lot of the CHROs that I work with that are members, they've, they've known me for three, four years and we meet face to face and they're like, I feel like I already know them and they know me. So I want to go back to the career. Go on, sorry. Oh, I was going to say, that's why when you started out, you know, a little while ago and you, you know, you let everyone know that we really did only just meet a couple of hours ago. That is yeah. fact true but i feel yeah. like i know you because i've i've been watching and listening your you know to your podcast for the last couple of years so i was like wow that's actually true i really don't i really didn't know chris until this <laughs> yeah, but, know yeah exactly but we hit off straight away and and uh I'm, yeah. I'm happy we're here now i just want to go back to the career transitions piece because yeah. sophie sophie smallwood in the chat brought up a really great point and we did discuss this in that earlier about the career transitions going from um uh, uh, uh maternity leave Back to work yes and uh, yeah. and and by the way sophie i've recently become a dad myself personally and my wife we're just starting that conversation right now and there is already some anxiety on my wife's side and she won't mind me saying that um as well uh, about you know what that means for her to go back now as a mum, or mm -hmm. uh, as you know it says it's very different so can you touch yeah. on that as well because i know you've also looked into that 
Yeah, well, and, and so I'll say, I, you know, I do often talk about it as I, you know, it is it is not a part of my research at this at this point, but I do believe that my study could be replicated. Yes. Um, looking at that group as well, or that transition, I should say as well, right? So my research is very much focused on, um, you know, army uh, to yeah. civilian transition. But I believe that after the fact, I could very well, I could very easily replicate it looking at um, that stay at home mom um, population who then chooses to go back to work. And mm -hmm. what does that mean in terms of that career transition? And what does that mean in terms of that identity management, right? We, and, you know, Chris and I were talking this morning, right? We, we, kind of accept that once a mom, always a mom, right? Like Chris and I were joking about the fact that, you know, we're, you know, we are our adults well into our career and our moms still call us to check on us. If they get us <laughs> like, I'm not sure Jen's okay. I should call her. Yeah. Right. And, and that still happens. And, and so, you know, once a mom, always a mom, but you, you know, that, and that's an identity that we don't expect anybody to let go of, but then, what does that look like and how does one manage that when let's say they you know become the the chief marketing officer of their organization and now they have these you know what feels like competing identities of being a mom being a chief marketing officer and how do we how do we help them in in the organization manage that and i think you know that is critical to that whole conversation of belonging, that whole conversation about, you know, we know that, you know, we have a loneliness epidemic, right, in this country. And you can, I mean, and and we've heard it said for many decades that it's lonely at the top, right? Yeah. So, you know, you talk to, to executives and sometimes they feel the most isolated. Mm -hmm. um, and yet they're the ones trying to, you know, potentially manage some of the most complex identities of you know their identities in their family units and their identities at work, um, and so yeah, it, it's definitely um, I, I appreciate Sophie bringing up the point, and I think that it's um, it's a really critical conversation we need to continue to have. Yeah, I, even just a few days ago, I was speaking to one of our members, the CHRO of a, a large pharmaceutical company, and uh, I, I, I gave her a call. She recently became a, a, a mum, and uh, she went back after a very short period. I think only, only sort of two, three or four months. And uh, and she was like, Chris, you know, I, I'm struggling because, you know, it's quite strange. I mean, she's the only female on the leadership team, first mm -hmm. and foremost, and she just had a baby. So she felt a lot of pressure to actually go back to work, which also yeah. wasn't great. And uh, and that, that was already a concern. Uh, mm -hmm. And then secondly, the fact that she's like, Chris, they don't understand when I'm like, I have to leave this boardroom right now because I need to go and express milk. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, and my wife yeah. going through that now, even you know, like, how do you say, oh, sorry, guys, let me just interrupt yeah. our global strategy meeting. I need to go out and pump milk and, right. ex and express, you know, so that self sense of belonging is, is she should come, you know, people are looking at her differently, treating her mm -hmm. differently. There was even an instance where there was a global um, sort of strategy meeting that she didn't get invited to. Mm -hmm. And then they said, why didn't you, or oh, we didn't invite you because we thought you wouldn't want to travel. Right. So, uh, you know, unconscious bias, you know, uh, yeah. they, they meant it in, in their, they thought they were doing a good thing. Uh, right. Whereas in reality, now she feels excluded. So the entire, yeah. the entire leadership team is going to be at that meeting and she's not there Yeah. Um, as well. So these, these are real concerns. I, you know, I would say, you know, one of the most important things that, that I learned along the way, you know, just as it relates to um, diversity and belonging and, and, and making sure that we are including people and not unintentionally excluding people is just a really simple don't make assumptions. Yes. I, I remember early in my career. We all do it as well, right? I'm, I'm guilty of it. Everyone's guilty of it. Yes, yeah. it's natural. Yeah. We, I mean, we do. We have, yes. I mean, we have to be, we have to make a decision not to make assumptions because mm -hmm. left to our own devices, it's, it's a part, it's, it's, it's an economy of our brain power. Yeah, yeah. Right. Like we can't, you know, like you, there are just some things that you just go on rote and you just go on assumption because it would be exhausting if you stopped and gave 15 minutes thought to absolutely everything you do. Right. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to making decisions, you know, for your coworkers or about your peers, I, I would say, you know, use an abundance of caution and making assumptions. Right. I, I feel like 
you know, I had a, a situation early in my career where I had a boss assume that because I, um, you know, made some comments about loving the, the new house that I had bought in the town that I was living in, she made an assumption that I wouldn't be willing to relocate. And so she didn't bring a career opportunity to my attention because it would have required relocation. Well, I never said I wouldn't relocate. I did love the house that I just bought. I did love the community that I was living in, but not to the not to the extent that I wouldn't have considered a career opportunity. Yeah, that and also happens a lot. That I was like, wow, what a lesson. Don't ever make that assumption. Give people the option and what and then be okay with what they decide. Yeah. But sometimes it also works on about um negatively on the other side is then you stop sharing how you feel. Or, That's right. Or stop sharing that you've just become a mom or that something right. important has happened because you you think, well, what are they gonna think? That's you know, right. For me, a, a big part of mine was uh, for I suffer from anxiety and have done for, for my whole life. And only in the last two years have I actually started talking about it because mm -hmm. you know there would be weeks where I wouldn't even turn up into the office and uh, because I couldn't leave my house because I was I felt like I was having a heart attack every time I leave the door. And I didn't understand what was going on. And I was embarrassed sure. to tell my CEO and my sales director because I thought they're not going to give me that promotion because mm -hmm. they're going to think that, you know, I'm mentally unstable. I was embarrassed to tell my peers, my friends, my, even my wife that I was going through that and I would make excuses of why I wouldn't go to on a holiday or to this party or this friend's house sure. because I was feeling really anxious and I, I didn't understand what it was. And uh, again, I didn't want to tell anyone because I was worried about what they would think um, yeah. as well. So yeah, it's very interesting. Well, look, before we wrap up, uh, I think we can stay on there for another hour if we wanted to, but <laughs> uh, we, this wasn't even planned, everyone listening. And thank you so much for all your questions. We really appreciate it. And uh, we, yeah. we, we did this because we wanted to bring you guys on, on the journey with us. So it's been fantastic. Before we wrap up, we're gonna Jen, we're gonna jump into our quick fire round. You listen to the oh show, so, so you know what you know yeah, what's coming, right? All yeah. right. So uh, right. So I'm gonna ask you five questions. You've got 30 second seconds, sorry, to give us some amazing answers. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> what was the number one thing that was holding you back from becoming a successful HR executive? Self-editing. So sometimes not not being willing to bring up ideas because I would um, dismiss them as as not yet complete. Not yet, you know. I'm, I'm a. I, I like to brainstorm. I like to work with others to, to bring, you know, things to fruition. And so sometimes I wouldn't speak up and offer ideas because I knew that it was a bit half baked, mm -hmm. and I felt like I had to bring a finished product. But then I'd get caught up in not having a finished product because I need others to co-create with. So it put me in a bit of a spin. I wasn't, I wasn't speaking up but I also wasn't able to complete because I wasn't speaking up. <laughs> I know exactly how you feel. And I'm sure everyone listening right now can resonate to what you're saying. What's the best piece of business advice you've ever received? <laughs> I, it sounds crazy, but have a budget. For yourself personally? Or <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, no, for business, right? Yeah, I'm, joking, I mean, I'm joking. Yeah. That, yeah, I mean, whether that's when I was starting my coffee house that, that I co-owned with a, with a partner for, for seven years, Right. Or whether it's running an HR department and, and, you know, wanting to try something new like, you know, it's it sounds crazy, like or sound like it, it's something we take for granted. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It's something we take for granted. But I would say it really was the best piece of advice around, you know, resources are not unlimited. Know what you're going to know, you know, know, know what you're willing to, to spend on it and and set your budget. Um, what books would you recommend or a book? It doesn't have to be hate yeah. related. Would you recommend to our, to our listeners, any around a particular topic we've spoken about today that come to mind, or if not any, any HR book or, or books that come to mind? Yeah. To well, I mean, some of the, so, some of the ones that, that I literally order all the time and hand out to my team, but I'm a huge fan of Cy Wakeman's reality based leadership. Yep. Um, I am a huge fan of Mark Efron's, uh, one page talent management and, uh, everything that Dave Ulrich writes, because <laughs> I'll, I am, I'll tag I am, him in. I'll let him know. <laughs> yeah. Big, big Dave Ulrich fangirl here. So I have, I have all of his books. He signed a couple of them for me. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that's, I mean, those are, are definitely reality-based leadership really definitely changed the way I led teams. 
Um, and so that's, that's why I literally, I, you know, I hand that one out all the time. And uh, similar on that point, could you say some online resources that you use? You know, if we looked at your internet browser at work, you know, where are you spending your time to keep yourself up to date with current events and, you know, what's happening in this new world of work? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, current events, I mean, I, I love my morning brew newsletter <laughs> that shows up in, in my email box every, every morning. Yeah. So it's a fi- like a financial news newsletter, which is just great. I think they do an amazing job with it. <laughs> I have to say Georgia State University's uh, business library is probably in my history more than anything right now. Just, just doing a ton of research. Gosh, what else? Well, I know we discussed LinkedIn earlier because that's how we. Oh. <laughs> you can't. Absolutely. Can you can you plug Lin- LinkedIn whilst live stream into LinkedIn? I don't know if that's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No. Yes. And 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 I think LinkedIn does a, a fantastic mm-hmm. job with with some of their aggregation of of news stories and things. And I I definitely that's that's definitely high on my list. Yeah. It's uh. It's I, I love obviously that's how we connected right. We wouldn't be yes. here right now. LinkedIn message phone call here we are right and not, right. Not, not only are we here live on linkedin but i'll be seeing you in a few months in new york right so right. it's incredible how you're just one connection away from anyone that's and, right uh, and, that, that, and it's been sort of a, a game changer for me um to, to be able to connect with all of you guys and to bring everyone listening uh, great minds like yourself so it's it's, it's fantastic well look thank yeah. you so much for taking the time out to join us on the show it's been Thanks, Chris. incredible it's been great to get to know you this morning and, and having you here this afternoon and i'm sure everyone listening would agree you definitely provide some great insights and advice for everyone so thank you very much for that awesome. before Thanks for having me. it was fun no problem before we wrap up if there's yeah. sort of one one parting piece of guidance you could give to other hr leaders that are on their journey or developing on that journey what would that be and then secondly if anyone wants to get in contact with you, what's the best way for them to do so? So I, I would say, you know, my parting piece of advice is just, you know, now in a time where, you know, technology um, is is going to continue to change the way we work, don't forget the human and human resources and don't forget to stay connected. And I think that that's, that's going to be our task um, as HR professionals. And then as far as getting a hold of me, probably the best way is LinkedIn. Um, I, uh, I do check my LinkedIn every day. Um, shamefully, we all say that shamefully. We're like, Oh (laughs) yeah, (laughs) yeah, yeah, I do. It's, it's, it's here on my phone and I'm always looking at it. So yeah, please shoot me a, shoot me a note, uh, shoot me an inbox and uh, on LinkedIn and I will absolutely respond. Fantastic. Well, for everyone listening, guys, once again, thank you for joining us. Um, if you're not already um, following me here on LinkedIn, if you enjoyed the content, make sure you follow me here and also follow follow, follow Jen as well on LinkedIn. Uh, Jen, we need some more content from you. <laughs> okay. Get it out there. Uh, you get it out there. And uh, um, if, if you guys are available at 3.30 p.m. on Friday, we'll be going live again. Uh, with another workshop so hopefully uh, another podcast and workshops hopefully we'll see you all there 